happened to have a couple of uh, circumstances that worked out well where I had a chance to meet the man and ask him some questions and talk to him and uh, the highlight of my entire flying career. I'll have to say that now. He was uh, my hero from the time I was old enough to listen to my parents talking about World War II and Doolittle and uh, it was just a real thrill to finally meet the man. Jimmy uh, was born in 1896 in Alameda, California and at a very early age uh, his mom and dad moved him to Nome, Alaska because there was a rumor going around during the gold rush up there that you could go down to the beach and pick up gold nuggets without any kind of work. When they got up there, they found out that that wasn't necessarily true. And Jimmy's dad decided that since he was a good carpenter and he knew how to build furniture, that maybe there was a job for him there. So that's what they did. Jimmy started school, of course, when he was four or five years old. <coughs> and it didn't take long for the bullies in the school to, to realize that since Jimmy was the smallest kid in his class, that they could pick on him. Jimmy didn't like that. He thought that there was a better way to live. And uh, mostly it was because of his stature. Uh, there may have been another reason that they picked on him a lot. Uh, I believe that his mother wanted to have a daughter. Uh, you can kind of take that whichever way you want. And I always figured that anybody with that much hair is gross, grossly overdressed anyway. But uh, So he figured that the best way for him to take care of these bullies was to learn how to box. And he did. And he became very good. And he wasn't the kind of a guy that would wait around and be chivalrous and let the bully take the first hit. He would get in with the first blow. And then he would follow it by a combination so that once they were hit one time, there was probably eight or ten more right behind it. And he always went for the nose. Because you could either break the guy's nose or make him bleed. And even bullies didn't like to see their own blood. So Jimmy became pretty good at that. Uh, moved down to uh, California and when he was about, uh, in 1917, he was about 20 years old, he joined the Signal Corps. Uh, as, a, a, as a cadet, a, a pilot cadet, to learn how to fly airplanes. And this was his ride. It was the Curtis JN-1, or what they called the Jenny. Quite a powerful airplane, 90 horsepower. At a top speed of about 75, and a low end speed of about 45. Uh, Two pilots, or two uh, seats in there, you flew solo from the back seat. And if you look close, you can probably see what looks like an old Model A or Model T radiator on the front, since it was uh, water-cooled. No brakes on either one of the wheels, no flaps. You didn't have to worry about that stuff. Just about as simple as you could get an airplane. The, uh, the climb rate, they said it would climb 2,000 feet at sea level in only seven minutes, which was really rocketing up for those days. And I didn't know whether that was the vertical speed or whether it was the horizontal speed, because probably 2,000 feet horizontally in seven minutes would have been pretty close too. He was able to solo in seven hours and four minutes, according to his logbooks. And it was a big thrill. How many pilots in here? I know there's a couple. Yes, you probably all remember your first solo flight. I know I remember mine. Uh, my first solo flight kind of reminded me of my first girlfriend. I didn't know a hell of a lot about what I was doing. It was over way too soon. And I couldn't wait to do it again. So, and even Doolittle said that as old as he was when I met him, he was in his 90s, he said, yeah, I remember my solo flight and could tell the entire thing. So. He, he got soloed, and then he flew the airplane as much as he could. And he loved to take it up and find out, okay, 75 was the top speed. Lower the nose, get it to 80, see what it felt like, see if it all stayed together. Which took a lot of guts, because it, they never wore parachutes. And he learned to fly a lot like uh, the rest of us did, the, the two-bucket method. They started off 
with a bucket labeled experience. And it was empty. So they would fly around. And the other bucket that they had was labeled luck. And it was completely full. So the idea was to fill this bucket up first before this one ran out. <laughs> Doolittle came close a couple of times. And I'm sure if you had any flying time at all, it came pretty close to yourself. So he needed to test this airplane every time he went up, and find out what it would do. He was flying, uh, as he was going out for the very first uh, lesson, his instructor talked to him about the airplane for a long time and told him a lot about aerodynamics and everything. Jumped in the airplane, got it fired up, and they were taxiing out to the field because there was no runways. Just a great big huge grass field so that they could line up into the wind. And every time they were taxiing out or taxiing back after a flight, had somebody on each wing to help them turn the airplane because there wasn't enough air across the rudder to actually control it. As they were taxiing out, they heard this loud crash and looked up and pieces of two airplanes were falling down all around them and three bodies. There had been a mid-air right over the top of them. A student flying solo was killed and an instructor and a student in the other airplane were injured, but they were okay. They shut the airplane down, got out, did what they could to help everybody. Once they got it all cleaned up, the instructor walked over to Doolittle and said, okay, back in the airplane, we're going to go fly. And that was the minute that Doodle had to decide, am I done here or do I want to learn to fly? So he went ahead and flew. Every time he went out as a solo pilot, uh, he would try to find something to do, try to some way to, to test the airplane. And he was flying one day, and he was flying right down a road, and there were two soldiers walking the other direction. And they were talking to each other and had their heads down. And Doolittle thought, well, they're right there. I'll just give them a little thrill and give them a buzz. So he went past as low as he could, and neither one of them even looked up. One of them just kind of casually waved as he went by. He thought, well, I must not have gotten low enough. So he made a 180 and turned around and came up behind these guys. And he got lower this time. He got so low that he hit one of the guys in the back of the head with a wheel. And that wasn't the half of it. When he went past, he looked back and he see the guy on the ground and he didn't realize there was a barbed wire fence in front of him. He got hooked up in the barbed wire and was dragging a couple of hundred yards of wire and finally brought the airplane down. Well, now he's got to go back and tell the colonel how this happened. While he was trying to get out of the airplane, one of the guys ran up, and it happened to be the one that he hit, still bleeding from the head, wanting to know if Doolittle was okay. And Doolittle thought that was kind of strange. You know, I hit the guy with my wheel. He's worried about me. So into the office, talked to the colonel, uh, back out, and uh, don't know whether they got grounded out of that one or not. But a little bit of experience in the one bucket, and about a handful of luck out of the other one. <laughs> one of the things that they loved to do was chasing ducks. Because they found out that the ducks around San Diego were just about the same speed as the Jenny. So they could find a flock of ducks, get up behind them, and then cut one out, almost like a cutting horse. They would cut one of the ducks out and then follow the duck. Whatever the duck did, they had to stay right on its tail and do it. And one of them was a little smarter than Doolittle was. Took him up a blind canyon, and Doolittle was just boresighted on that duck. He couldn't see anything else. All of a sudden, the duck made a left turn and went diving out, and there was Doolittle at the end of the canyon, too narrow to turn around and running out of altitude, airspeed, and ideas all at the same time. <coughs> As he got up to the end, of the canyon, he thought, the only thing I've got left for me is to pull the yoke back as hard as I can, take that last bit of airspeed, see if I can pop over the top. Well, it worked about halfway. From his cockpit forward, they made it over the top. The rest of the airplane he left on the other side. <laughs> now he's got to go back, tell the colonel about this one too. 
as he was trying to get out of the airplane, he caught his pants, probably jodhpurs, you know, the big wide ones, caught his pants and his underwear on something and ripped a great big hole in the back. So he went in and he had to talk to the colonel. The colonel just chewed him out right and left, you know, after he found out he was chasing a damn duck in a $10,000 military airplane. Uh, he was dismissed, and instead of just making the facing movement and getting out of there, he took one step backwards, trying to get closer to the door. Saluted, then he thought, I've got to do it. Turned around, went out the door, and there's his bare butt hanging out. The colonel thought it was a message for him. <laughs> when he got out, uh, he actually had to come back up, and the colonel had to chew him out some more, and then he got to leave. But on the way back to his barracks to find out uh, or find some more clothes to wear, he was able to show the other guys how much he had gotten chewed out. Because look at this. You know? <laughs> he worked for a while for the army in uh, southern Texas, helping him chase Pancho Villa. And every time they would go out and every time he would fly, he would go past the El Paso River. And there was a bridge over the top of the river, way, way high, and it was called the High Bridge. And he kept looking at that bridge, but there were two supports holding that bridge up. And he looked at it, and those supports were too close for the Jenny to fly underneath of the bridge. And for some reason, pilots have to do this. I don't know. But he couldn't get through there. And finally, one day, he thought, I know how to do this. So he headed right straight underneath of the bridge, got right up real close, rolled it 90 degrees, slipped through, and came back out on the other side. What he didn't realize was there was a power line and a telephone line. And he took both of those out, and they were hanging behind the airplane and slowing it down and pitching the nose up, and he thought he was going to crash. Found a place to land where he could get out, get all of this wire and stuff off of his airplane, and hide it somewhere, and then fly back and tell the colonel that he ran into a, another duck or something. He had a good friend that he flew with a lot, and they went out to a field away from the main field one time. And he had bet his buddy that he could get out of that airplane and crawl out and get down on that axle and ride that axle all the way through his buddy's landing. The buddy said, you can't do that. He said, I bet you five bucks. Okay, we'll try it. So they got up, and again, no parachute, crawled out of the airplane, onto the lower wing, forward, and then uh, from the leading edge down, and got onto that axle, and rode it all the way down to a full stop. But he paid him the five bucks. Figured they'd got away with it, because they were out at this air, airfield that was away from the main base. They got back to the base, and found out that Cecil B. DeMille was filming on that field. And they were taking pictures of airplanes for a movie that he was making. And he was really impressed with this. So he got the film developed, went to the colonel, and he said, this is what I took pictures of. And I would like to meet this pilot because I think he can help us with this movie. And they showed the film to the colonel. And the colonel went ballistic again. Uh, Doolittle said he spent more time grounded or not on flying status than he did actually flying in the air. So a little more experience and take out some of the luck. So anyway, uh, he got away with that and, of course, lived. He went on to, later on in the mid-30s, fly the GB. And this was an airplane that, uh, according to him, someone had decided that in order to set speed records, you needed a lot of engine. So they put a lot of engine on a fuselage, and then as kind of an afterthought, they said, you know, we're going to have to have some wings on this. Here's some leftover parts. Let's, let's make these stubby little wings and a stubby little tail, and then see how fast this thing will go. Doolittle was not prone to any kind of profanity, but he told me personally, he said, this was a bitch to fly. He said it was the most dangerous airplane he ever flew in his life. He said you not only flew it every minute that you were in it, you flew it every second that you were in it. You relaxed for a second, the thing would kill you. And according to one source, they told me that Doolittle 
was the only guy to fly this airplane and live. So that, ought to, that should have kept all of the other pilots out of there. He went on to uh, MIT and picked up a master's. A master's in aeronautical science. And I don't think they even taught that before he had requested it. That was in 1924. The next year he went back, same subject, and got his doctorate. So now all of a sudden he's Dr. Doolittle. Way before it came out in movies. He worked for Shell Oil until 1940. And then the Army decided that they would take him out of the reserves and put him active uh, because they knew that they were going to need him somewhere, either in Europe, and at that time they didn't know about the South Pacific. So we're back into, back into the regular Army. In the reserves, he was a first lieutenant. When he went into the Army, they made him a major. So Doolittle was never a captain. He also was never a full bird colonel, but that's later on. He was the first man to make a blind takeoff and landing. He had worked with a guy named Sperry, and they built an artificial horizon for him. Put the whole thing into the panel where he had uh, altitude and uh, navigational aids and everything else in there. Put a safety pilot in the front cockpit and flew the airplane around, actually got into the clouds. And the guy in the front, all he could do was sit there, not touch anything, and hope that the guy in the back knew what the hell he was doing. Came back in, found the runway, landed it, and it was still just like this, had the hood over it the whole time. No controllers, no GPS, no coffee service. And of course, the one thing that he was most famous for was the raid from the USS Hornet. I don't know whether you can see it, but they, they got this out of one of the back rooms today. It's got the 16 B-25s on it. It's the Hornet. has the two white lines down the side that they use to put the left main and the nose wheel on to keep the wing tip on the right side out of the bridge or the, uh, the, the tower. And it's an exact replica of it. Actually, here it looks a whole lot smaller than what it probably looked like from the airplane. There's 16 B-25 sitting on there. The ship in the back, uh, I'm not sure whether it's the Gwyn or not, but Mike Fellows' dad was the executive officer on the Gwyn. That could be the Gwyn back there. Uh, nothing is, uh, none of the engines are started yet on this one. So it may have just been a photo opportunity. In fact, there's a guy standing all over the place down here. The deck was 809 feet long and 83 feet wide. And the reason that they put those white lines on there is because the B-25 had a wingspan of 68 feet. So there was not an awful lot of room extra in there to, to keep from hitting the, the tower. They were scheduled to take off at about 400 miles out from Japan. They were 800 miles out on uh, April the 18th, early in the morning when they discovered a couple of ships out there, Japanese ships. They didn't know whether they had radioed back to Japan that there was a carrier task force out there or not. But they decided that the thing to do was take off and take off early. They had modified all of the B-25s in Minneapolis and put uh, long range tanks on it, extra tanks, take a lot of the armament and the weight and stuff off. Now all of a sudden they're 400 miles further out. The Navy bless their hearts, went out, started filling five-gallon cans with fuel, brought them over, stuck them on the airplane. They put as many five-gallon cans of gas on there as they could. So originally, I think they were at gross. Now, they're over gross. But it's sea level, they got a pretty good wind blowing. Maybe it's gonna work. The ship, they got up to 20 knots. The uh, gale that was blowing that morning was about 30. So they had about 50 knots of wind blowing right down the deck. So that was going to help quite a bit. Newton, of course, was the first guy off. Here you can see this one's got both engines running. And I think the next one there has got the, uh, the right engine running. And the other one hasn't quite started up yet. They didn't start those engines up until the last minute so that they would be able to save that much fuel. But they did want them warm enough when they took off. The Navy had told them, because 
uh, the Navy had put all of their airplanes below decks, folded them up, got them downstairs, and they told them that if they were attacked, the first thing that the Navy would do is to push all of those B-25s overboard, every one of them, so that they could get their airplanes out and protect the rest of the task force. Do the nose first. And if you'll notice, the nose wheel is right on the white line. That's, that's Doolittle, right on the white line. And the other line here is for the left main gear. This is the launch officer out here. The guy in the cockpit's watching him, and he's giving him the signal to bring the engines up. They had little, uh, little skinny levers, and they had the two little balls on the top so that you didn't cut your hand. When you got those all the way forward up against the instrument panel, it was balls to the walls. That's where the term came from. So he kept giving them this, and they were balls to the wall. Bill Bauer, who was the number 12 pilot, and Doolittle, both of them told me that they almost bent the levers, trying to get that thing up just as far as they could go. The launch officer is watching them, and in this one, he's watching the bow, because they're getting, uh, the bow's going up 10 to 25 feet, and he's watching it. And when the bow came all the way to the top, he gives them the go sign, and drops to the deck. So as they're starting to roll, he's got the yoke all the way back, and he now the, the deck is coming back down, so he's rolling downhill a little bit, and about the time it was ready to rotate, the, the bow was coming back up, so the deck gave him a little bit more of a push into the air. And with full flaps and 50 knots of wind, they only had to take 10 or 15 more miles an hour, and they would be in the air. This is just as he was about to lift off. And he's real close to the end of the deck, still with full flaps. There it looks like he's got a heck of a good way to climb, but the airplane is climbing, but the bow of the ship is going back down also. So from 53 feet uh, from the nose to the tail of the airplane, and they're just about, eh, I would guess, maybe 50 feet off of the deck. So it's not climbing too badly. This is making the other guys feel pretty good. The boss has made it. But you know that darn good and well that when he's right here, there are 75 hearts behind him that are beating at about 300 beats a minute because they're going to be doing the same thing. This was taken from one of the other ships. And again, 50 some feet there, and you figure out what he is, he's climbing pretty darn good. Right straight out left turn and a downwind and came back and made one more pass right down the deck at 500 feet. The reason for that was the airplanes had been on the deck of this carrier for about two weeks. The wet compass was going nuts. The 20,000 pounds of metal all over the thing. So the compass was completely unreliable. They needed to set their directional gyros against something. So they made that pass right down the deck, and there's a guy standing out there on the tower with a blackboard. This is real technology. A blackboard, and it had written on it in chalk what the magnetic heading of the ship was. So as they went by, they'd set the directional gyro and get away from the traffic pattern, if you will, dropped it down on the deck and stayed 10 feet off of the ground, or off of the, the, the ocean, the rest of the way into the island so that they wouldn't be detected. Once they got to the shoreline, they still stayed low until bombing time, and then they popped up to 1,500 feet. Uh, again, the white lines to keep him out of the tower, and uh, the next guy was up and ready to go. The second guy felt a little more comfortable with this, because Doolittle had made it, and they didn't want to be the one that didn't make it. So the second one was good, the third one, uh, Ted Lawson, who wrote uh, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, which I brought with me today. Uh, Ted Lawson. And I just happened to have uh, a page in here that has all of the survivors of the Doolittle Raid, and this was several years ago, because they're down to two now. Uh, Ted autographed this for me, and, uh, and I was able to keep it. Ted and his wife, Ellen, both. He was in the number seven airplane. Went through the same thing got off of the deck, and as the deck came down, 
he's flying, and then the deck came up, and the airplane disappeared. I couldn't see it. It was right down on the water. The deck came back down again, and there he was. He was still staggering along, trying to fly. He finally got flying speed out of it. Lawson called to his co-pilot, said, flaps up. And he looked down, and he said, we never put him down. So Doolittle proved you could take off from a carrier with full flaps and all of that extra lift. Lawson proved you could do it without flaps and would have preferred not to do that. The thing that made me curious is with all of the people in all of those airplanes and all of the Navy guys running around on the deck, why didn't somebody see that they didn't have the flaps down and walk out there and go, you know, make some kind of a motion to get the flaps down. But they were able to make the takeoff. All that extra fuel in there. They told them when they left, uh, use the fuel out of the five gallon cans first, but when a can is empty, don't throw it overboard. Because that would leave a nice trail of breadcrumbs for the Japanese to go right back out and find the carrier. And only doing 20 knots, it was gonna take a while for them to get back to Pearl Harbor. So uh, wait, hold all of the five gallon cans and dump them all at the same time. So that was the way that was gonna work. As soon as the last airplane was off, they made a hard left turn and they took the whole uh, carrier or the task force back to uh, Honolulu. Um, it was something else I was gonna say there. Anyway, they went back, uh, back to Honolulu. The, uh, all of the flight plans of the 16 airplanes, oh, they got all 16 airplanes off according to the Hornet's logs in 61 minutes, which isn't bad. Uh, shows what you can do if you don't have to mess around with air traffic controllers. <laughs> uh, anyway, all of the routes of these 16 airplanes into the Japanese island, they didn't want them all to be the same so that everybody was in a nice great big long line because it wouldn't take a, a mental genius to figure out right straight behind that line is where the, the carriers were. So everybody had a different route to go up there. It looked like a bowl of spaghetti when you looked at it. Because some of them would go way off to the west side and then make their run back uh, toward the east across their target. Somebody else would go some other direction and come back in. So it was all over everywhere. They told them that uh, once they got to their targets, drop their bombs and make a left turn and head toward China. Because they were off so early, they were going to wind up over China in the middle of the night instead of early morning. So no daylight, everything was dark, they were in a storm, it was going to be ugly. They took all of the Norden bomb sites off of all 16 of these airplanes. And what they had was a small piece of plastic, about so long, and across the bottom there was a little hump on it and they had marked off ground speed. Now the altitude was taken out of the equation because everybody bombed from 1500 feet. So all you had to do was figure the angle between your airplane and the target and figure your ground speed. So this little piece of paper could cost them I think something like uh, less than 18 cents a piece mounted on the side of the the bombardier's compartment up in the nose. If you were doing uh, really, really fast, then the angle had to be a little less so that you could look right down the top of it and when you saw the target sitting on the end of that, that's when you let the bombs go. If your ground speed happened to be slower, you didn't have to drop them earlier, so it was turned down a little bit more. And that's all it was. Very, very simple. And one of the guys had figured this out and made these 18 cent things. Uh, Tokyo, Yokohama, Yasuka, Kobe, and Nagoya were the ones that they uh, had all bombed. The only close thing to a fatality on the carrier deck was the number 16 airplane, which is the very last one on the end, the last one to go. Because of the 50 knots blowing down there and the prop wash from all of those airplanes and everything, it blew one of the sailors into the prop of the number 16 airplane, took his arm off but he lived. And they went ahead and ran the engines up and it didn't feel like the prop was uh, gonna vibrate or anything, so they went ahead and took off. Bill Bauer, 
Uh, it was a man that I met that got me hooked up with Doodle, lived in Boulder uh, for many, many years as a retired Fulbright colonel. Uh, he was the number 16 airplane. I'm sorry, the number, number 12 airplane. And he told his crew after they had bombed and actually did very little damage militarily. But what they did for the U.S. in morale was superb. Uh, savings bonds, uh, sales went up and war bond sales went up and people were happy for a change because in the 131 days since Pearl Harbor until they got off of the carrier the Japanese had pretty well done whatever the heck they wanted in the South Pacific so it was a real boon to American morale for the Japanese it went the other way all of a sudden for the first time in its history somebody had attacked the island so they started bringing carriers back, they started bringing airplanes back, bombers back from different bases, uh, bringing troops back, because they knew that the island had to be defended now. So it took that away and took it out of the equation uh, for the guys that were out there fighting on, on, the, on the islands. Bill told his uh, crew, he said, we're gonna fly this pig until it quits. He got up as high as he could thinking maybe they could break out on the top of all of this storm and stuff. They never did, so they just stayed on instruments. And pretty quick, sure enough, one engine quit. And they knew that the other one was gonna be right behind it. About 30 seconds later, the other one quit. Bill rang the bailout bell. And I asked Bill one time, I said, were you scared when you jumped out of the airplane? He said, nobody jumped out of my airplane. Jumping out of airplanes is for sport parachutists and paratroopers. He said, every one of my guys were down on the floor. They slithered all the way back to the open bomb bay door, slid over the side, maybe held on for a few more seconds, and then they let go. Because it was dark, it was raining, it was cold. Nobody wanted to get out. It was either get out or die. Two choices. His bombardier navigator was Waldo Byther. He said he always liked Waldo, and he had even more respect for him after the raid, because Waldo was one of those guys that not only knew his job, but he knew the job of everybody else on the airplane. And Bill said if he had to, Waldo probably could have landed the airplane. Not pretty, but he could have got it down and saved some lives. Waldo was crawling back to get out of that bomb bay door, and he popped his parachute by catching his D-ring on something in the airplane. Waldo didn't even hesitate. Rolled over on his back, unhooked everything, took the parachute off, opened it up, started gathering up all the silk and stuffing it back inside, and got it all buttoned up, rolled over, got the parachute back on, crawled back, slid out the door, pulled the ripcord, and it worked. <laughs> well, Bill said he always had a soft spot in his heart for Waldo after that. Doolittle had the same problem. Whoop. Yeah, no real choice. Jump ahead there too much. Uh, Doolittle had the same thing going. They were up high, waited till the last minute, engines all quit. And Doolittle had told his crew, he said, when you get out of the airplane, he said, don't lock your knees because you don't know what kind of terrain is underneath of us. He said, we know what the altitude is for us above sea level, but we don't know what the terrain is. You're going to hit the ground and not even know you're there until your toes touch it. You lock your knees, you hit hard, it's going to shove your hip bones all the way up into the top of your body, you're dead. Keep your knees flexed. So he did the same thing, kept them flexed. Got down close to the ground and at the very last instant he was able to see something, but it was too late. He landed in a rice paddy about half full of water. The other half was what they call night soil. I see some heads doing this. That's human excrement that they use to fertilize all of these rice paddies. So it was a rather inglorious end to a long day. He managed to gather up his parachute, started walking around, and he found this little shack, and he thought, well, something to get into and get out of the rain, because it was cold, he was tired, his day was over, the work day was finished. Opened the door, went inside, kind of stumbled around a little bit, found a couple of sawhorses with a big box on top of it, 
thought, yeah, that might be a good place to catch a nap. Walked over, took the lid off, stuck his hand down inside, it was all soft in there. It was a casket, and there was a body in it. <laughs> and he thought, I don't care how tired I am, I am not sleeping on some Chinaman in the middle of the night. So he found a corner, uh, rolled up in the parachute, and tried to get a little bit of sleep. Next morning he wakes up, backtracks, and finds his airplane. Gets back there, and his uh, engineer, um, they lost his name. Uh, anyway, his engineer was sitting there because he had found the airplane. The engineer was really, really glad to see Doolittle. Walked over to give him this great big hug. Got real close, stopped, turned around, went upwind, and just said, Hi, Colonel. Nice to see you. Uh, no way in hell is he going to give the guy a hug. So from that time on, things got a little testy. Uh, Lawson had dropped his airplane in at the shoreline uh, thinking that they could get a, a halfway decent landing out of it and everybody survive, and they did survive. But Lawson wound up with a really, really bad gash in his left leg. And before they could get medical attention for him, uh, days and days later, the thing had gotten infected, it had gotten gangrene, and uh, Doc Watson, who was one of the crew members, the, uh, an MD that had qualified as a gunner, and they put him on the airplane, and he flew the, the raid. Doc Watson was the one that finally took uh, Ted Lawson's leg off, and they left it in, uh, in China. About uh, a month later, when they all got out of uh, China, uh, that's when Doodle wound up back in the US at the White House. The, uh, of course, the news came out uh, that the airplanes had bombed Japan. They asked uh, Roosevelt where the airplanes had come from. Of course, at that time it was still highly classified because the ships weren't all the way back to Pearl yet. At 20 knots, you know, it's going to take them a while to get back there. All Roosevelt would tell them is that they came from Shangri-La, the mystical non-existent city out of uh, Paradise Lost. That's all he would tell them. Uh, it was driving them nuts. They didn't know who it was that had made the raid, uh, didn't know anything about it. Fifteen of the airplanes crashed. One of them survived. The last order that they got before they left the carrier was no one is to go to Russia. The only airplane that did go to Russia was piloted by the only West Point graduate out of the whole bunch. Out of storage tech one time during his speech, and there were two guys from the academy sitting in the audience, and they both kind of looked at either, each other and looked at me and smiled a little bit and thought that was that was kind of funny. So I sent him back. Uh, Doolittle got a uh, a telegram off and was ordered to the White House. His wife Josephine, uh, he sent her a telegram. She was in California told her that she needed to go to the White House and meet him there. So she took a commercial flight partway across the country, then couldn't get any connections, needed to get there in a hurry, put her on a military transport, and I think most of you guys that flew in the military know what kind of restroom facilities there were on military transports for women. Zero. They got to Andrews Air Force Base, she got off of the airplane, and told the young man that was there with a the staff car, she said, I have to go to the bathroom. He said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we're due at the White House. Put her in the car, she went to the White House. Met Jimmy at the door to the Oval Office. Gave him a hug, she told Jimmy, don't squeeze too hard. <laughs> I really have to go to the bathroom. He said, I'm sorry, honey, you can't right now, you gotta hold it. The president's waiting for us and we're late. You don't keep the president waiting. Went inside, and of course they talked a little bit about the raid. This is where Doolittle got the Congressional Medal from the man. Uh, that's his wife Josephine, and um, there was there. That's the uh, uh, 
and I've lost my ship page on that too. It's the uh, the chief of staff of the Air Force and the chief of staff of the uh, Army Air Forces. Yeah, right. And so they all got to witness that. So gave him the medal, stepped outside the door, and Josephine disappeared. <laughs> uh, where she went, they did take care of business. I heard this from Doolittle. Uh, he told me the story, and it's a little different than what he put in his book. Maybe he did that just for his wife, I don't know. But I cannot look at this picture of Josephine without how she must have felt standing there, knowing that you don't soil yourself in the Oval Office with the President there and the two Chiefs of Staff. Uh, a little bit of a pained look on her face uh, that she might be able to pick out there. The results after the raid, uh, eight of them were captured, three of them were executed, which was against the Geneva Convention, of course. One died in a prison war camp, four of them were tried and found guilty, sentenced to death, but they were put in prison and they were kept there until the uh, end of the war. Now, I'm going to come away from that for just a second and go to this. This is a, uh, a painting or a print of a painting, and this was selected by the Doolittle Raider Scholarship um, Committee to be the, the main picture that they would sell for the Doolittle Scholarship Fund. This went to several reunions and the names of the surviving crew members were on here. Uh, Doolittle's is right here. Uh, the one that none of these uh, were autographed by was Ted Lawson because he never went to any of the reunions. And one year Bill called me and he said, the reunion's coming up in a couple of weeks. He said, and it's in California. After the reunion, I'm going to go to Chico and I'm going to visit Ted Lawson and have him autograph some of this stuff. And if you want anything autographed, let me have it. So I gave him this and these two books and another couple that I have at home. And we got Ted Lawson's uh, signature on it before he passed away, Ted and, uh, and Ellen. This, I never did really like it too much because this is Doolittle's airplane uh, by checking the uh, tail number on it. I think it's too low, too far out from the carrier, but nobody asked me. <laughs> anyway, uh, I bought this, pardon? I thought you said they went down to 10 feet. After they, after they made the pass at 500 feet. So this was probably still in the climbing phase. Uh, well, they made that pass and then they would make a right turn away from the carrier because there were other guys taken off behind them. Anyway, a friend of mine that lived across the street from Bill Bauer uh, showed me his and I asked him what it was and he told me and he said, you want one? And I said, yeah. He said, we'll go across the street. He walked across the street and introduced me to one of Doolittle's Raiders, uh, the only guy that uh, lived in Colorado. And there were 125 apiece. I bought three of them. And everybody I showed it to wanted one. So within about a year, I had sold over 20 of these to friends of mine at Storage Tech and, and every other place that, uh, that I took it. Uh, shortly after that, my wife, Janet, at the time, we were going to San Francisco for a weekend. And I thought, uh, you know, I'll call Bill. I called Bill and I said, what do you think the odds would be in meeting the general? I don't know. He said, let me call his social secretary, his uh, second son, John. So I'll call John and see what we can do. Called me back in a couple of days, and he said, we got it set up. Um, down at, uh, just around the Pebble Beach. He said, supposed to meet him down there, gave me a time, gave me the address, and we drove down from San Francisco. My wife and myself and my oldest daughter. And... Uh, met him over at Doolittle's house, or his, uh, it was a duplex, because he was living on the grounds where his wife Josephine was in uh, rehab for a very, very massive stroke that finally took her life, but he was living on the grounds. Pulled up to the driveway, and that was the first thing that I saw. I know this is a very bad picture, but it was the best. I it's a California license plate. Congressional Medal of Honor, and it has a number on it. 
This one happened to be number 48, which is the 48th person in California that had gotten a congressional. And as soon as I saw that on the Cadillac, I thought, I've got the right house. This is it. John met us at the door and introduced himself. We walked in. He said, uh, the general's in his bedroom putting on his jacket. He'll be out in a minute. So I just stood there and I was absolutely in awe because one whole wall right next to where I was standing was pictures of Doolittle with every president from FDR through Clinton. Clinton, there's got to be a joke in there somewhere. But anyway, and then there were pictures again underneath of those of Doolittle with movie stars. Jimmy Stewart, another general, and Bob and Dolores Hope. Uh, Dolores Hope and Doolittle's wife, uh, Josephine, were involved in all kinds of charity things, raising money for charities. And out of the corner of my eye, right next to me, was a five by seven. Not a very big uh, frame, something that you would get at Walmart for $4.99. And I turned to see what it was, and it was the Congressional Medal of Honor. How many of you have ever seen one? other than a picture. There it was, right next to me. I couldn't believe it. I heard the bedroom door open, and I turned, and here he came. Little guy. Nobody ever called him little. Nobody ever called him small, especially with four stars. The man walked out, stuck his hand out, walked right straight toward me, and he said, Hi, Tracy. I'm Jim. And I shook hands with him, and I thought, there is no way in hell that I can call this guy Jim. <laughs> it just isn't going to happen. General, maybe, uh, sir, a lot. I didn't know whether to get down on one knee and kiss his ring, or both knees, or just lay down on the floor. And he was as nice as he could be. We talked airplanes for a little bit, and then it was time to go to lunch. And I had heard from Bill before we ever went out there that the general was going to ride with us going over to the restaurant. Well, I didn't want to rent a Volkswagen Bug. <clears throat> I didn't want to rent a Toyota or anything small. So we splurged a little bit and got a Lincoln Continental. And, <laughs> and he rode in the right front seat with me. And the girls were in the back, and you know, chap like, they would, like women do, some women. And um, I don't remember ever driving a car any more carefully than I did that day. Both hands on the wheel watching all kinds of traffic. Everybody was a threat, because I thought, even if I have a flat tire with this guy in my car, it's going to make news worldwide. An accident would be uh, the end of my life. We got to the restaurant, went inside, and there were six of us, uh, John and Priscilla Doolittle, the general, myself, my wife, and my oldest daughter. And a woman walked by with a, a baby carriage with two twins in it, or a set of twins. And that got the conversation started, because Doolittle said, oh, look, twins. And he turned to me and he said, did you know I have twin grandsons? I said, no, I didn't. He said, yeah, John and Priscilla, the twin boys. I said, that's different. I said, I've got twins, and one of them is sitting right here. This is my daughter, and she has a twin brother. My wife had twin nieces. Six out of six people were related to twins. So for two hours, we talked about twins. <laughs> we talked about how many diapers they use in a week, how many times they're fed, and who would wake up first in the middle of the night, get fed, and wake the other one up, and how much of a drag it was, talk, talk, talk. And I thought, sure, I want to talk twins. I want to talk twin engine B-25s. <laughs> you know, give me a break. So for four hours, we talked mostly about twins. This is uh, myself and the general, and it was the only picture anybody got of me with him and caught him in mid-chew, so it doesn't even really look like him. Uh, this looks more like him. That's my oldest daughter. And uh, he just loved having women all over him. And this is uh, his daughter, Priscilla their daughter-in-law, Priscilla, and my uh, daughter. And this goes back to the first reunion. This was the 18th of April in 1943. North Africa, 
Doolittle had been assigned to Europe and found out that, I'm sorry, oh, I thought somebody said, uh, Doolittle found out that a lot of his raiders were down in North Africa. So he flew down there, probably flew himself, uh, instead of just riding along. I'm not sure where this was or why they didn't have glasses, but they were able to find the coffee cups. And I don't know what they had in the cups either. Um, clear down here on the left side is uh, Bill Bauer. And not all of these are raiders. Some of them were just guys that happened to be hanging around and they wound up in the picture. So every year, Well, I'm not sure, but that would make sense that uh, wherever he was in the South Pacific, that area would have been pretty well targeted. I never thought about that, but that's probably a good point. So, uh, anyway, uh, every year when they were going to have their reunion and that they decided that uh, they would do that, and they had every year except for a couple of years during the war when the guys were scattered all over everywhere. Bill Bowers said that they were the biggest bunch of freeloaders in the history of military. <laughs> Everybody wanted them to come to their city. And they bribed them. You get free hotel. You bring your wife. All of the food that you want. All of the liquor that you want, which was a pretty good bill there. Everything was taken care of. All they had to do was get there, and it never cost them a thing. So they kept, uh, they kept that uh, up for a long time until last November, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, biggest freeloaders in history. In uh, 1959, they were invited to Tucson, and the city of Tucson had this made up for them. It's uh, a, uh, a three-position box, and it folds up and closes up. Uh, this is stored at uh, Harmon Hall at the Air Force Academy. It's still there. Uh, the cadets were able to get in, and before they took this to the reunion, they would have to turn some of the goblets over. These were all solid silver. If they were right side up like this one, it had the man's name on the side. Once he passed away, they turned it over and turned it around, and his name was written upside down on the back. So there were 80 of those, one for each one of them and a bottle of uh, 1896 cognac, here it is right here, and that was to be shared by the last two survivors. They would open that up, pour the drinks, and toast all of their fallen comrades. Yes, sir? Since the Japanese dominated China, did the flyers all know that they were on a suicide mission just to crash land? There was no they didn't have a whole lot of choice. They went back and actually they got far enough back away from the Japanese held stuff that uh, they, were, they stayed away from that, but the Japanese were right on their tails. Uh, the Japanese chased them out of uh, uh, the whole time that they were in China. And according to one report that I read, the Japanese came in, and anybody that was even halfway connected with getting those raiders out of China was executed, maimed, cut up. Uh, they said everything except cannibalism. And 250,000 Chinese died because of Doolittle's raiders. And they were glad to do it, glad to get them out of there. It's amazing that many of our airmen Escape. Yeah. Yes, it was. And it was uh, two or three weeks before they finally got out. Uh, Bill Bauer had uh, his ticket, the ticket that he had, the train ticket across India. That was one of his souvenirs. And his pocket knife that he had carried uh, from the time he was that big. And the D-ring from his parachute. And I asked him one time, I said, why did you think, or why did you have the... Uh, the foresight to keep that D-ring. I said, were you scared when you got out of there? And he said, you're damn right I was scared. He said, I didn't wait to get out of the airplane to find the D-ring. He said, I had a hold of it when I got out of the airplane. 
And he said, I pulled it. And he said, it was two days later before I could finally get my fingers off of the damn thing. He said, that's why I kept it for a souvenir. They'd peel his fingers back off to get it out of there. So that was his souvenir. And, uh, but anyway, the goblets uh, down at the academy, Bill Bauer, since he was closest to there, he was designated to take this thing to every, re every reunion. And, and he did. He was very faithful in it. He'd drive down a couple of weeks prior. A couple of cadets would go over and help him get it out because it was locked up and guarded. I think there's a 24-hour guard on it. I'm not sure. But uh, take that out of there. And Bill was invited over to my house one night. And uh, he brought that over. And I had uh, 15 or 20 of my close friends. And they all sat around and Bill told the story again. His wife Lorraine didn't come because she's heard that story for probably 25 or 30,000 times. But that's the way the, the, the last of it finally went, the 80 goblets, the doors that closed on it and packed it up. And uh, Bill was quite a guy. The kids got to get up there real close and get a look at it. And uh, they thought that was, that was pretty neat. Really a nice guy. Bill's wife passed away before he did and she went to Arlington. And then when Bill died, he was buried in Arlington with a distinguished flying cross. The other 79 pilots and crew members all got the, dis the DFC. And uh, Doolittle's wife, when she died, she died about two months after we had lunch with him, or breakfast. And uh, she was buried in Arlington. She actually died on Christmas Eve of 1988 on the 74th wedding anniversary of the two of them. Coincidence, I suppose, but uh, different. So the last one that has died, um, let me back up just a little bit. The last reunion was in November of last year at Wright-Patterson. They had uh, three of the four guys there, Dick Cole, who was Doolittle's co-pilot on airplane number one, uh, Dave Thatcher, a sergeant, he was Ted Lawson's engineer on the ruptured duck, they called it, the number seven airplane. Ed Saylor, he was the engineer on the next to the last airplane, number 15. They opened the bottle and split it three ways. I don't think they drank the whole thing. It was 119 years old, probably spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, maybe it was okay then. And uh, Robert Height, he, he couldn't make it to the last reunion, but he passed away in March last month. Ed Saylor passed away in January, so there's only two of them left. And I put this in here because it's uh, probably the most notable picture of Bob Height. And in Japan, when they took him off of the airplane to take him to the prisoner, prisoner of war camp. So they've got to... Uh, Two of them left, both of them in their 90s, of course, and uh, not doing all that well. This is uh, at the Smithsonian. It's the, uh, the Doolittle uh, display, and probably has a lot more in it now than what it did at that time. And this one I particularly like because it was back in the barnstormer days when you had to wear all of the clothes just to stay warm. Here's the, uh, the print that we've got. There were other prints that were, I thought were better, but like I say, they didn't, they didn't ask me. And these came out uh, right after the raid, Do More for Do Little. Uh, Red Skelton, you probably remember him, and Clem Cadiddlehopper. Clem Cadiddlehopper was known to say, Do Little, do it. <laughs> I thought that was nice. You had to, you had to know Clem Cadiddlehopper in order to understand that. But that's part of that raid uh, also. And uh, I believe, you know, that's, that's uh, at the Smithsonian also. Sounds like Doodle was just giving the bully a bloody nose like he always did. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> write, that, write that down for me. <laughs> uh, this was uh, Bill Bauer lived over there in Boulder right off of uh, Table Mesa. And they had a brand new park that was opening up, and they dedicated it. As, uh, it's actually William Bauer Park because he was such a great uh, 
a great guy and part of the neighborhood. Uh, first time I walked up his house, I was a little surprised because his mailbox sits up on the end of a propeller. I don't know what the propeller was off of, but I thought that's pretty appropriate. So I saved that and uh, firsts for Doolittle, first cross-continental crossing in less than 24 hours. I can do that in a car now. First to do the outside loop, it was not in the Jenny. Jenny was barely stressed for positive Gs, let, let alone negative Gs. The first blind fight in uh, 1929 in, uh, in less than 12 hours across the continent. And the career summary, you can't read that, but it goes through his Air, Air Corps time, 1917 to 1930. And it was the Air Corps up until, I think, 1949 when the Army Air Corps got their divorce from the Army. That's what they told us in basic. Uh, it was... 47. 47? 47. OK, you're right. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel and Brigadier General. He was never a full colonel. Uh, commanding General of the 12th Air Force in North Africa and in Italy and England for the 8th and then actually went to uh, Okinawa in 45, but it was almost over. And a lot of time with Shell Oil Company. In fact, uh, he had a nice retirement from Shell Oil. When he retired from the Air Force, uh, they sent him a retirement check. He didn't want it. He sent it back. Well, that was going to screw up their books, so they sent it back to him again. <laughs> he said, there's no way I'm going to live off of the, excuse me, the government tit, and uh, didn't. Every month when he got that check, it went to his son who took it and uh, got it endorsed, gave it to charity. No, it was, it was the president that did that. Yeah, gave him a congressional and, uh, and he skipped a, skipped two pay grades, so. <laughs> Uh, let's see where some of the decorations and stuff that he got. This I got out of an old Life magazine. You may not recognize these guys, but the guy on the left is Joe Foss. Uh, he was a retired general. He was uh, governor of South Dakota, Congressional Medal of Honor. Doolittle in the center, Congressional Medal, uh, four-star general. And the guy on the right is uh, Pappy Boyington. Uh, the Corsair pilot, for some reason, never got past major. Um, <laughs> don't know what was behind that, but uh, anyway, all three of them uh, in Arlington with the congressional. And there's the man. Maybe the best pilot. Oh, let me back up just one one step. Uh, uh, Doolittle died in uh, 1993 at the age of 96. Bill Bauer was not only the keeper of the Tom team, but he was also the Raiders bugler. And they asked him to play taps at Arlington for his former boss. And Bill accepted that. He got the bugle, stood up, played two or three notes, and emotion just completely took over the man. He could not finish. There happened to be a boy there named Paul Crane, and Paul was the great-great-grandson of Doolittle and was also a bugler. And he stepped in, took the bugle, and got Bill back out of the way and played taps flawlessly. So it was a real nice, uh, a real nice change. But the man, probably the best pilot, well, okay, second best pilot. Sorry, Bill. Um, <laughs> One of the best pilots that the country ever put up. My hero from years and years ago. His experience bucket filled clear to the top two or three times. And he still had luck in the other bucket. And the title of his autobiography, when he wrote it, I could never be so lucky again. And he still had luck. I really liked the guy. Rest in peace, pilot. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yes, sir. No, 
I think I saw the movie, but. I don't remember reading the book or uh, the movie. The movie I'm thinking of was uh, World War One. So. Uh, You know, uh, Disney put out uh, Pearl Harbor not too long ago, and I was really anxious to see that. But they had a chunk in there about Doolittle, and in order to make the romantic side of the story work, they took a fighter pilot, a fighter pilot with no multi-engine type, and put him in the Doolittle raid. Never happened. I was so disappointed over that, and I. I guess I spoil the movies for my wife a lot <laughs> because I'm looking for the little technical things that, that shouldn't be in there. And uh, taking a fighter pilot and putting him in a B-25 isn't happening. Any other, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Tracy, I don't know if you know, but how the heck did they refill the fuel tanks on the B-25 to the flight? Five they had uh, a, uh, a place in there just for that reason. Uh, when they put those extra tanks in in uh, Minneapolis, of course nobody knew what they were in there for. In fact, nobody knew where they were going except Doolittle until they got uh, two days out to sea out of uh, San Francisco. But there was a, a place in there where they could unscrew the cap. Of course, the smoking lamp was out uh, for you Navy guys. Um, <laughs> That means that you can't smoke uh, for your non-Navy guy. But there was a place back there that they could uh, dump the fuel in and carefully and then throw the empty can in the back of the airplane somewhere. So it, it, got, it got them a few extra miles out of it. And so they were a little further into the storm <laughs> before they quit and everybody had to get out. And some of us in here even know what it's like to have an airplane run out of fuel. I won't point anybody out, but uh, <laughs> do you have another? Well, you had mentioned, I think, also something in one of the write-ups that you little was concerned he was going to be court-martialed because he had lost all the points. Yes, he told uh, his uh, crew chief, uh, Paul or Leonard, he said, uh, he said, I feel really bad, and uh, he said, uh, they're going to get me back to the States. He said, I'm going to be court-martialed. Uh, busted in rank and probably spend the rest of the war in Leavenworth breaking up rocks. And Leonard said, no, I think you're going to get a promotion and, and a medal. And turned out the...